Do you like horror? Do you like the 80s? Do you like horror in the 80s? Then you'll love In Search of Darkness. It's a four hour plus epic retrospective on 80s horror. This critically acclaimed documentary features an incredible lineup of horror legends, including John Carpenter, Doug Bradley, Tom Atkins, even Elvira, Corey Taylor, and of course, Lloyd Kaufman. Oh, and there's even an interview with this one nerd, James. I think The Shining is probably the best performance in any horror film, maybe ever. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. Click the link in the description to pre-order your copy today and you can get your name in the credits, along with a poster, pin, postcard, and digital download of the film. But act fast because it's only available until midnight, the witching hour on Halloween. In all the years of Monster Madness, I knew one day we would get to this. And because uh, I've talked about so many horror films of the 30s, and you know, it's a good reminder that not all 30s horror movies are universal. So, are universal monsters. In Germany, this is uh, M, directed by Fritz Lang, yeah. who did Metropolis, mm -hmm. uh, starring Peter Lorre. It's one of his early roles. And um, the subject matter is pretty brutal for 1931. Yeah extremely dark yeah i mean just considering this was made in 1931 and it's about a child murderer yeah a serial killer who specifically stalks children mm -hmm. who's played by pierre laurie and it's just so morbid without showing very much at all yeah there's but, i don't think there's any violence in the entire movie really no there's a, a couple scenes near the end where people are fighting but they never show anything they allude to it in such a way that just is disturbing uh, mm -hmm. And also, there's no music. Yeah, well, um, all early 30s uh, horror films, or, or any films really from the early 30s, didn't have music because they had just come off the silent era so abruptly. Mm -hmm. And I guess they didn't really think to put music in or, or didn't know how or whatever. And it only makes it creepier. Yeah, it works so much... more. I think it works without the music fun. Yeah. It just, it, it, the, the beginning scene just starts off mm -hmm. a kid walking down the street mm -hmm. and it keeps cutting between the kid and the mother mm -hmm. waiting for her kid to come home. She meets the murderer, but you never see the murderer at first. You just see his shadow. And then you see, you know, a, just mm -hmm. a collection of images that show you that what's happened to her, her fate and everything. And it's mm -hmm. just upsetting. It's, yeah. you see her, him buying the girl a balloon from a street vendor mm -hmm. it cuts to the mother waiting for her then it cuts back it cut it goes to her screaming out her name out the window and then it just cuts to empty rooms and then eventually you see the girl's ball roll out of these bushes and the balloon floating into like power lines mm -hmm. and then it goes to the next scene and it's like it without the music and just knowing the just the feelings it's it does such a good job not showing mm -hmm. and and not uh you know blatantly throwing it in your face what's going on but your mind paints this picture that's way worse than what you know mm -hmm. is is on screen and it's such a disturbing film it's also an, an incredible film mm -hmm. uh the way it's shot everything uh this is it's one of my favorite mm -hmm. suspense films like horror films it's just upsetting and disturbing and sad mm -hmm. there has been other scenes where a child is murdered in, in other movies uh frankenstein mm -hmm. the monster does murder a girl but it's by it's a different circumstance it's like by accident mm -hmm. um but but yeah i mean horror movies especially like the ones in hollywood were were limited after like 1934 when the Hayes code came into effect because then it was just restricting films from doing anything too violent mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, so a lot of these early 30s films got away with all kinds of stuff. And this one being a non-Hollywood film, this one being made in Germany, uh, I think they were able to do more. Really, Fritz Lang, I guess, got lucky to make the movie when he did. Mm -hmm. Because this was right as right before the Nazi party. Yeah, really uh, before World was, War II. The Nazi party was on the rise at this time. And uh, uh, Fritz Lang uh, had a lot of trouble making this film. Mm -hmm. um, so 
Yeah, I mean, it's pretty disturbing thinking like the, the context and the time period. So it's kind of interesting. It's it's not a whodunit film. Like mm-hmm. you're not trying to figure out who the murderer is because the audience know the whole time. Yeah. You don't see Peter Lorre very much until past the hour mark. You start seeing more of him. Yeah. Um, you see him in a few brief scenes early on. But uh, the whole time we know who it is. And we're just waiting for uh, the police to find him. But mm-hmm. there's also vigilantes who are looking for him. Yeah. And everybody's kind of just arguing with each other. So they're very inept at finding the killer in this movie. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it takes the... It's the criminals that are... Basically, it starts with a bunch of people just accusing everyone of being this murderer. So it goes into this witch hunt mode. Mm-hmm. So to which the police decide to just raid every place they possibly can, which is hurting now the criminal business. And the criminals decide, you know what? We got to find this guy. We have to put an end to this. We can't deal with uh, constant raids from the police. And the police aren't doing a good enough job. So we're going to go and get this guy. So they employ all the beggars of the city to basically look out for this guy, anything they see, and find this murder. Mm-hmm. And then finally, I mean, the the scene I think that really makes the movie is at the very end when yeah. he's caught by the vigilantes. Then he just he, finally, Peter Lorre gets lines. He, he finally gets to mm-hmm. speak. And yeah, he, and um, he's demanding uh, a fair trial. Like he wants to be turned over to the proper authorities. And they they just have him like in a basement or something. Yeah, in a in an abandoned building somewhere. Yeah, and of course the whole thing it's like okay, like this guy's a child murderer. He he needs to get what he deserves. But then it's the first movie I can I, I can think of where you're put face to face with the the killer at the end, and you and you hear him kind of like explain what's going through his head, and he's like saying that he. He doesn't like that he kills kids. Like he he says he can't help it. He's like almost like it's like this curse or something. Yeah. Which they would exploit in more horror films and more supernatural ways, like the Wolfman. You know, he doesn't want to kill people. It's just like like something that happens to him and he can't help it. So like this guy is has some kind of like illness where he yeah. just has to, he's like compelled to to do these horrible things and mm-hmm. kill children. <laughs> And uh, when he finally speaks at the end, it's like that whole monologue just resonates. Like that's the- it's a really powerful scene for in in mm-hmm. all of film history. Mm-hmm. It's, I'm not a huge you know uh, black and white or, or or old timey kind of movie guy, but I saw this in college uh, in a film mm-hmm. study class, and I remember you know going to that class. It was like oh cool whatever I get to sit and watch mm-hmm. movies most of the day, but this was the first mm-hmm. movie that I watched during that where I was blown away that the fact mm. that the subject matter is not something that I thought mm. would be a movie in the 30s, yeah. talking about a, a murderer of, of kids. Mm-hmm. And then um, the the monologue at the end, just him saying the, the how he can't help it and, and the people don't care. And mm-hmm. it's both sides are valid. You don't want to like the murderer at all no you know the no. entire time you want him to to get what's coming to him but when he speaks and he explains mm-hmm. it it's such an uh, like a heartbreaking scene it's like tragic yeah it's like, yeah and and you but you still you still somewhat side with the people like no kill this guy because they bring up like it, it, what if he mm-hmm. gets out what if he is pardoned and he's just free to murder again mm-hmm. and the thing is, even the the ending, not to spoil it, but it doesn't really give you much satisfaction in what no. happens. It kind of just ends, and it. But it's such a powerful film, and the story in between really like wraps everything together. All the people that are coming together and mm-hmm. seeing how society kind of reacts. You see this in normal everyday life. Mm-hmm. You know, anytime there's anything going on in the media or anything, it, this is much like, you know. Uh, alluding to the future i guess in a way or something but it's this movie in in my opinion is it's not um i'd put it in like a top list of my movies i would definitely Mm. say i just find this movie really amazing Mm -hmm. uh it's shot extremely well everything about it is just it's very mesmerizing and it's uh it, it makes you really feel an emotion you feel for the parents you feel mm. for you know 
him mm. at the end and everything. It's just a it's a movie that you you wouldn't expect to feel the way you would, and you wouldn't expect it from something coming out of 1931. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, lots of horror movies, they had psychological elements like, you know, Jekyll and Hyde, where it's like the good and evil nature. But this is one where there's no supernatural element whatsoever. Mm-hmm. This is just like real life, what could really happen. And uh, Peter Lorre, you know, he's he's went on to become like one of the big horror stars, but he, um, he never had like one role that he was really known for. He's kind of just Peter Lorre. Like, yeah. He's just, you know, after this, he was in Mad Love. The Beast with Five Fingers, that one really sticks out to me, which is about a, a killer hand. So it's a little silly, but the, but Peter Lorre sells it with his acting. Yeah. And that's another one where he's like psychologically disturbed. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, uh, Tales of Terror, that's probably the funniest one that he's done. So he has like a humorous side, too. Mm-hmm. So he's had a lot of range as an actor. But this is really where he got his start in like horror. I was reading the um, on Amazon when you rent this, it has the uh, trivia, mm-hmm. and it said that he was actually the first person to ever play a James Bond villain, I think. Oh, really? Uh, he w- it was in a television series huh. of James Bond or something, and he played one of the he played one of the first ever villains or something. And I was mm-hmm. like, wow, that's like he had a long range, and I mean, he's parodied in Looney Tunes. Oh, all the time. They always, yeah, yeah, yeah. they are constantly using like, you know, there's always the yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of character, and he's always, you know, mm-hmm. he, he was someone I never had heard of mm-hmm. before, but I realized as time went on that I had mm-hmm. seen him in so many different things, whether or not I knew it. They make me laugh. <gasps> I didn't realize who he was until I, I saw this movie and learned about who he was. But mm-hmm. it's an it's an incredible film. We also mentioned how there's no music in it whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Um, it it may be one of the first movies to have a musical motif, however, yeah. because the only music in the movie is the character whistling. Like he's yeah. always whistling, and it's Hall of the Mountain King, and. Um, so every time you hear that, you know the killer is near. Yeah, and that was the first movie I think to do that to have a motif to come in like that. Like one of the earliest movies I know to have a full score is King Kong, and then it seems after that point mostly every movie had music. Mm-hmm. But this was in that one like short window of time when horror movies didn't have music, and that only made them creepier. Yeah. No, it definitely helped. Honestly, I think it, the movie would not be the same mm-hmm. if it had a musical score behind it. It's what adds to the, the the foreboding and creepiness of the movie. You're basically a fly on the wall watching as this all yeah, happens. You yeah. don't feel like it's almost even a movie. Mm-hmm. It feels like you're along with these people in the room, mm-hmm. seeing how they're each going to go about finding out, you know, figuring out what they're going to do and mm-hmm. eventually trap the murderer. The thing is, Peter Lorre is the main character of the movie, but he's barely in the movie. Yeah. It's more about all these other people just mm-hmm. trying to find him, but the idea of him as a murderer is always in your mind. Mm-hmm. And it makes him the main character, but he's not in the movie as nearly as much as many of the other characters in it. Mm-hmm. But his performance is also the standout point of it, too. Mm-hmm. You yeah, also have to say, I think there's more smoking in this movie than I've ever seen in yeah. any movie ever. <laughs> there's like every scene, especially with the police, it seems like it's always in a cloud of smoke. Yeah. That they're they're just smoke. Sometimes they're smoking so much that there's smoke covering their face. You yeah. You can see. I think there's one shot in particular, I think, where they're all sitting around a table. Every single person that shot is smoking, is smoking like yeah. something. And there's just this layer of cl- cloud on the yeah. top of the frame. There's even that one guy who has a pipe with a cigar stuffed <laughs> in it. I did that before. Before I was dead. Like, it, like they all are... They're, every single person <laughs> in this movie smokes. There's a guy who even has like a bunch of used cigarettes and cigars in a box <laughs> that he pulls out and smokes one of them. Like, it's... It's kind of gross. <laughs> like, it's just like every single person. The the only other thing I have to say, I mean, the only negative that I have about the movie is that um, it, it's it's very slow paced. Like, mm-hmm. especially until like the second half when you start seeing more of Peter Lorre. Yeah, and it, it does feel like there's long parts, especially when they're chasing him in like the uh, the, the lockers, like the storage areas, mm-hmm. and it just goes on and on and on. Yeah, and on. but you know. 
it's it's definitely a fascinating piece it's it's something you know they show you in film school and yep. uh, you know rightfully so i think at some point everybody should check this out mm-hmm. you know? yeah for sure 